Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about congestion management and how to configure queuing on your Cisco devices. When we talk about congestion management, we're talking about queuing. So there's some congestion on the router or the switch. There's more traffic coming in than it's able to send out. So it has to buffer that traffic. It has to put it into a queue. Congestion management is manipulating the queue so that you give better service to the traffic that requires it. There's two types of queuing policies that are commonly used. That's CBWFQ, which is class-based weighted fair queuing, and LLQ, which is low latency queuing. With CBWFQ, it gives bandwidth guarantees to specified traffic types. So when you've got congestion, you can say for this particular type of traffic, I'm going to give it so much of the available bandwidth. LLQ, the low latency queuing, is class-based weighted fair queuing with a priority queue. So this is good. The configurations are exactly the same. It's just the LLQ has got an additional line on there where you can give priority to a type of traffic. Traffic in the priority queue is sent before other traffic. So with LLQ, you can have a priority queue there, which you'll probably put voice and video in. And for your data applications, you can give them bandwidth guarantees. So let's look at how this is actually configured. And it uses the MQC, which is the modular QoS command line interface. The MQC is built with three main sections. First up, we have the class map, which defines the traffic to take an action on. Then there is the policy map, which specifies the action to take on that traffic. And finally, you have the service policy where you apply the policy map to an interface. When the MQC first came out, it was just used for QoS, but Cisco uses this framework for loads of other different configurations as well now. For example, if you're configuring your security policies on a Cisco firewall, it uses the same framework as this. Loads of other things as well use the, frame, the same framework. So it's good that when you learn it the first time and then you go and you learn a different type of technology it's, that's still from Cisco, very often it uses the same framework, so it makes it easy to learn that new technology. Okay, let's look at an actual example and then we'll look at the configuration for this. So with our example, we've got the HQ on the left, we've got a branch on the right, and we've got PCs and IP phones in both locations. We send data and we send voice between the two locations. We've looked at the calls that we're making between the locations and we've seen that we need to support 10 concurrent calls between the HQ and the branch over that WAN link. For our example, each call is taking 25.6 kilobits per second. And I use this to make the maths really easy. Um, it, if, you are, if you do work with voice, you'll see that different codecs, which means how we convert the actual spoken voice into the ones and o's, digital uses a codec, and different codecs can use different bandwidth. For our example here, let's say that each call is 25.6K. We need to support 10 concurrent calls between the sites. So 25.6 equals 256K. So we provision 256 kilobits per second of bandwidth for our voice calls. We also analyze the data traffic between the two sites. And in this example, we have determined that 512K is required for data on average. So 512 plus 256 equals 768K. So that is the bandwidth on the link that we provision from the service provider. 
I know I'm using really low numbers here, but big numbers make my head hurt. So it's easier to understand and explain using these low numbers. For a real world deployment, just make the numbers bigger. It works exactly the same way. Okay, so we've provisioned our bandwidth at 768K and we know that that is going to be enough bandwidth for normal operations. But we also know that data is sometimes going to burst above 512K during busy periods. And during those periods, we could also have those 10 concurrent calls. So when that happens, the link is going to get congested. We don't want to use first in, first out queuing, because if we do that, the voice packets are going to get stuck behind the data packets and we're going to have bad quality phone calls. We want to bump those voice packets straight to the front of the queue so they don't get delayed and we get good quality calls. So let's look at the configuration. So the first part of the NQC is the class map where we specify the traffic that we're interested in. Our config there is class map and then give it a descriptive name, anything you want. I've called it voice payload, match IP DSCP EF. And then class map call signaling, match IP DSCP CS3. The IP phones are marking their own packets. So whenever a phone generates a packet which is spoken voice, it will mark it as DSCP EF. Whenever it generates a signaling packet to set up the call or tear it down, it's going to mark it as CS3. So we're looking for those particular packets coming from the IP phone. We recognize them with our class maps. Next thing that we're going to do is we're going to specify what we're going to do to that traffic in our policy map. So I've got policy map, I've called it one edge. Again, call it anything you want, descriptive name. Then class voice payload, which references the class map that we configured already. And then I say priority percent 33. Priority means put this traffic straight at the front of the queue whenever there is a queue. So if there's no congestion, this does not take effect. But when there is congestion, the queuing policy will kick in and any voice packet that comes into the queue will now be bumped straight to the front of the queue. We'd provisioned 256K for our voice calls, which is one third of the 768K link, which is why I've said priority percent 33. So voice packets will go straight to the front of the queue and are guaranteed 33% of the bandwidth. Next, I also, I want to give a bandwidth guarantee to my call signaling traffic. This traffic is not so important, so it doesn't need to go in the priority queue. If it gets delayed, then the call might just take a fraction of a second longer to set up, but it will still work just fine. But I want to make sure that those signaling packets do get there. So that's why I'm giving them a bandwidth guarantee. These packets don't require much bandwidth. So real world, you would figure out exactly how much bandwidth they do require. Here, we've figured out that it's bandwidth percent five that they require. So now whenever there's congestion on interface, our voice payload packets go straight to the front of the queue. They are guaranteed 33% of the bandwidth as well. Our call signaling packets don't go straight to the front of the queue, but they're guaranteed 5% of the bandwidth. And if they require more, the call signaling packets can take more bandwidth than that as well if it's available. The priority queue is guaranteed 33% and it's limited to 33% as well because if it was able to burst up to 100%, then it would take all of the bandwidth and nothing else would ever get out of the router. So it would break all other traffic. So the priority queue is guaranteed that much and it's also limited to that much as well. For the bandwidth statements, it's guaranteed that much and it can go higher if it's available. Okay, so that is us giving the required service to the voice payload and the call signaling. Next is class, class default. Class default means all other traffic that we haven't specified higher up with a class map. So everything else, and then we say fair queue. This is a best practice command to put in. It's a more fair queuing policy than first in, first out. As first in, first out tends to penalize small packets unfairly. unfairly. Fair queue is a better queuing mechanism. So it's best practice to put those commands in. And then finally, we need to apply the policy to the interface. If you're ever working in QoS in the real world, this is the bit that's really easy to forget because you do the class map where you say the traffic you're looking for, then you do the policy map where you say what you're going to do to it, and then you're like, 
okay, I'm done. And it's easy to forget to put on the service policy. If you do that, nothing happens. You have to apply the service policy for this to take effect. This is done under the interface. So in our example, it's interface serial 000. We say bandwidth 768. You have to do this if you're using a priority percent so it knows what this percent is. 33% of 768 is 256. That's where it gets the value from. So put the bandwidth statement on there. And then finally, to apply it, we say service policy out one edge, which is the name of the policy map. Okay, so that is the whole thing. If you missed this earlier, for the CCNA exam, you do not need to know this configuration. I'm showing it here because I think it makes it a lot easier to understand what's happening when you see the configuration. But you don't need to memorize this for the exam. For the exam, you need to understand all the theory. So you need to understand what QoS is. You need to understand the different QoS mechanisms like classification and marking, our congestion management, which is queuing, and also policing and shaping, which is going to come up in the next lecture. So you need to know the theory, but you don't need to know the configuration. You'll need to know that when you move on to specializing in some of the other tracks or going on to the CCNP level. Okay, so that was congestion management and queuing, and I'll see you in that next lecture for policing and shaping. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.